Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's seminar on two topics. The first topic being the social and economic determinants of Indigenous health, and secondly, engaging with Indigenous communities. If you're expecting to hear something different today, then you're in the wrong room, uh, but you're more than welcome to stay because I doubt very much if there's anything more interesting happening in Brisbane today. Um, all more important, exactly. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, this building stands and pay my respects to their elders past and present. My name is Wayne Briscoe. I'm Acting Deputy Director General, Community Participation in the Department of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and Multicultural Affairs, which is the State Government uh, Department. Uh, I'm joined uh, here today by uh, song woman Marucci, um, who will provide a welcome to country very shortly, um, but also Professor uh, Fran Baum and Dr Janet Hunt. Before I ask song woman uh, Marucci to provide the welcome to country and for the benefit uh, of those who are either in the wrong room or, or who are not aware, uh, the Closing the Gap uh, Clearing uh, House is an online research and information on what works to close the gap on Indigenous disadvantage. It focuses on what works rather than outlining the nature or the extent of the problems, um, both of which I think many of us would already be aware of. Today's seminar is another valuable step towards linking research and policy. By making the research available and accessible to all interested Australians, but it is of particular value to policy makers, program managers and service providers. Uh, I would like to let you know that the seminar will be webcast and recorded, so if you choose to identify yourself at all when asking a question, um, this will be on the webcast and um, forever held in a recording. Uh, it is now my great pleasure to introduce to you Songwoman Marucci uh, for a welcome to country. Thank you, Marucci. Balandico, Gundunum Belair, Balandico, Gundunum Belair, Yang in Dai, Yan Go, Gundai, Yan Go, Balandico, Gundunum Belair, Balandico, Gundunum Belair, Balandico, Gundunum Belair, Balandico, that's welcome to South Brisbane in the language of the Turubal people. When we do a welcome to country ceremony, that is done as a blessing of the gathering in song, and I will do that in a little while. Can we uh, take advantage of uh, the opportunity just to let the broader community know a little bit about the Turrbal people? We're supposed to be extinct, like back in the 1860s, we were documented as being extinct, and uh, it's one small family, so it survived the impact of European settlement um, upon our ancestral homelands. There could be other people out there who may be of Turrbal descent, but at the moment it's the, uh, the Turrbal people has actually had a native title came for the last 16 years or so. They went to trial late last year and we will yeah if there's put more out there let us know because we're probably getting tired of being small that little family that survived anyway um yeah so um we're the direct bloodline that descends on man that was nicknamed the duke of york way back in the 1830s he was documented as being chief of the brisbane tribe uh, by foster fans who was commandant of the penal settlement of morden bay at the time and um, if I wouldn't be standing there if it wasn't for a man named Isaac Moore. Isaac Moore owned both Baramba Station and Kenilworth Station, and it, it created a safe place in the 1860s for Aboriginal people. So um, besides being tourable, we're also part Gabby and part Walker and a few other things along the line, because I was actually born on Sherberg, so which is a melting pot of many tribes. Um, it has been for the last 110 years. So, um, so uh, yeah, so, uh, but um, the Turrbal people, yes, we're just waiting for what the judge's decision, I suppose, with regard to the claim, but still, 
we also uh, just wanted the broader community to know a little bit more about us. Yeah, we're still here and we'd like to interact m more with the broader community. We would like to also express our appreciation with the organisers of this event for asking us to be a part of your gathering this morning in this capacity. Um, it just gives us an opportunity just to share a little of our stories. I know we're luckier than most in this regard because I suppose living in us tradition of uh, one of the cities, you get more opportunities to express that, um, those thoughts, I suppose, rather because of the multiple conferences and gatherings people have on your ancestral homelands. But uh, I suppose, um, yeah, and we're very grateful of that opportunity as well. So I'll do the blessing of the gathering and I uh, hope everything goes well today. Uh, song woman Marucci for that welcome to gun country. Uh, if no one has heard uh, Marucci provide a welcome to country uh, before, um, I'm sure you'll agree with me. It's, it's very inspiring and very much appreciated. Thank you very much, Marucci. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Professor uh, Fran Baum, uh, who will be speaking to her research on what works, the social and economic determinants of Indigenous health. Uh, Professor Baum is a Matthew Flinders Distinguished Professor of Public Health and Director of the Southgate Institute of Health, Society and Equity at Flinders University. Professor Baum is a Fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and one of Australia's leading researchers on the social and economic determinants of health. In 2008, she was awarded a prestigious Australian Research Council Federation Fellowship focusing on development of effective government and community responses to social determinants of health inequity and social exclusion. Uh, she holds several uh, other national competitive grants investigating aspects of uh, health inequity and has an extensive teaching career in public health. At the end of this presentation, there will be time for questions, so I ask that any questions be held over to then. Thank you, Professor. Oh, well, good morning, everybody. It's, it's great to be here. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this beautiful land and thanking uh, Songwoman Marucci for the fantastic welcome to country on behalf of your people, the Turrbal people. And also to acknowledge your resilience through the processes of colonisation. It's truly awesome. So thank you very much. Um, and I guess culture and... Um, people's resilience is very much part of what I'll be talking about this morning. 
Um, I'll just give you an overview of, I just want to start off by looking at why social determinants are so important to health. I probably don't need to tell you that, but I think it's a, a good background to what we'll be saying. I, I just want to talk about the review that we did, what its limits are, what its scopes were, then look at what seems to work, and finally look at what we don't know. So that just gives you a guide to where we'll be going. Um, I spent uh, th three years working as a commissioner on this Commission on the Social Determinants of Health that was set up by the World Health Organization. And when we reported, we said the toxic combination of bad policy, economics, and politics is in large measure responsible the for the fact that a majority of people in the world do not enjoy the good health that is biologically possible. And we concluded that social injustice is killing people on a grand scale. And of course, if we apply that lens to Australia, then um, social injustice is really uh, killing Aboriginal people on a grand scale. And I, I think that's kind of the headline message of what we found. Um, in that work we did on the commission, our basic logic was, well, what good does it do to treat people's illnesses, addictions, and the top line should say, send them to jail, hospital, or welfare systems, but then give people no choice to go back to or no control over the conditions that made them sick, addicted, or commit crime in the first place. So you, you'll see that there we're linking all those social determinants to health also, but to a whole range of addiction problems and also therefore to, to crime. Um, so just thinking about, well, why are social determinants so important? Well, clearly, they do actually get under our skin and cause disease and uh, health equities. And I think you know, chronic stress is one of the biological pathways by which that happens. Um, and if we think about the biological effects of stress, then we know that it, um, both acute and chronic stress have huge impacts on the body. They, they affect our brain. They affect our immune system, our circulatory system, uh, our gland system, and reproductive. So there's a whole range of biological pathways. Um, and in terms of that, if, we, if, you, if you think about stress and the old flight and fl fight phenomena, then we know that there are very clear physiological reactions involved. And what the evidence shows on that stress is that if you're in a more powerful position, then all those biological responses actually return to normal so much quicker if you're in a position of power than if you're in a powerless position. So I'm sure you can think about what that means for indigenous people. Um, people with less power find it difficult to turn off that fight or flight reaction. Their blood pressure and heart rate stays high, adrenaline keeps circulating, um, blood does not get adequately distributed to other organs. So that's not a healthy state. And it, and it, it helps explain why something as seemingly abstract as not having much power actually translates into a biological effect. Um, and this slide is really just showing those three main body systems and the way in which stress works its way through those body systems to end up down the bottom as diabetes, heart disease, stroke, renal disease, infectious and cancer. And of course we know that indigenous people suffer um, huge rates of those. And this, this is based on the work of Sir Michael Marmot who of course was our chair on the Commission of the Social Determinants of Health. So this work very much informed our work on the Commission. Um, yeah, and I've just done a slide just to show, well, how social determinants cause mental health problems. And if you think about all the factors I'll be talking about in a bit, you can see very clearly how um, a whole range of social determinants, such as lacking control, living in poverty, having to manage on a low income, being subject to discrimination, being socially isolated, not having many meaningful social contacts, being unemployed, not being in permanent jobs, um, therefore adopting a whole range of coping mechanisms, um, perhaps living in areas where there's high disorder and lack of safety, perhaps having a childhood that hasn't stimulated maximum brain development, there being a whole series of barriers to seeking mental health care, those will be cultural, financial, class, and gendered, you can see that 
actually translates itself into chronic disease, depression, anxiety, and a range of other mental health issues. So I think it's important to think about those biological mechanisms when we move back to thinking about very upstream determinants of health, that these things actually do relate through a causal pathway to our physical health status. Um, of course, in, in terms of indigenous health outcomes, we know that there's something like an 11-year life expectancy gap, although the, 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 we're, we're still learning about the data on that. Um, we know in terms of illness that indigenous people have higher rates of both infectious and chronic disease. And in terms of risk, we know that Aboriginal people have higher rates of risky behaviour, but of course those behaviours are driven by high-risk social, economic and cultural environments that produce risky behaviours. So that just gives you a bit of background to the actual health inequities and how social determinants can affect um, people's status. In terms of the review that we did for the clearinghouse, um, in terms of the scope, well, it was a fairly small budget in terms of review budgets. It was a rapid appraisal. We focused very much on Australian literature and we tried where possible to include grey literature, i.e. that that hasn't been published in peer-reviewed journals. Our frame was um, looking at social determinants as distance and proximal determinants, so looking at some of the more upstream things like racism, as well as the more proximal determinants such as perhaps housing. And we had to do a lot of attribution of health and equity impact because people in housing and employment and other sectors don't immediately um, concern themselves with their health impact. So I'll, I'll show you in a minute one of the models we used to do that. And of course the limits of our work is this wasn't a systematic review in the sense of using a Cochrane type systematic review framework. We found that there's often no publicly available evaluation data of programs, and if there is, it's generally not a randomized control trial or not even a, perhaps a systematic approach to evaluation. So the evidence wasn't as good as it might be. And in a lot of mainstream programs, there's very little evaluation. For instance, who evaluates the impact of Medicare on indigenous health or the provision of universal education or so on. So, you know, th th those programs people can attribute claims, but it's very rare that someone actually does an evaluation of mainstream programs. So that reduces the evidence base that we have access to. Um, I'm, I apologize for this slide. I'm not sure. Probably at the back. And people at the back, you probably can't read that. It's a bit small. But it is actually in the um, report. So if you've got a copy of the report, uh, it, it comes fairly early on the report. You can look at that. But that's really a slide that is linking those kind of broad, very underpinning factors like colonialism, um, people's separation from land, family, community, and culture. And I'd ask you to bear in mind that those determinants are kind of fundamental, are flowing through all the others. They're really, really crucial. But then also looking at um, those key determinants of things like housing, employment, income, that they affect people's health behavior, and we've already looked at how they affect physiological and biological systems, and this all comes out as socio-economic health inequities with lower life expectancy, higher rates of disease, and also just poorer health and well-being throughout the life course. So that's the kind of framework that we started with and that we operated from. So, the question we were trying to answer was, well, what social determinants interventions work to improve indigenous health? And um, the, uh, one of the first areas we looked at was education. And um, we looked at the way in which education can be a pathway to health through giving people the opportunity to get jobs, increasing their ability for healthy living skills, to be, help, to be good parents, and even valuing culture can be part of education. Um, in, in looking at the sort of education success factors, we found that the program suggested that when students, when there were high expectations of students, that worked well. You know, people didn't say, oh, well, I don't think they're going to achieve much. People actually reinforced and said, well, we expect you to do well, to go to school, to go to university. And that was crucial to the programs that were successful, especially when it went hand in hand with promoting positive indigenous identity. 
You'll hear over and over again that community development focus, i.e. working with people rather than on people, was ab absolutely vital. Um, and I think one of the things to say about community development is, of course, it's quite hard to evaluate. It, in a way, it's much easier to build an evaluation around a behaviour change strategy. It's much harder to do it around community development. But the evidence that we come across in a whole range of sectors kept pointing to the importance of that community development, where people work alongside side people, they encourage them, they develop, not giving top-down messages, but actually working alongside people. Um, the evidence also suggests that good approaches need to be about whole of institution. It's not about having an Aboriginal health program off here to the side, it's about making it part of the mainstream education system. So the whole system is geared up to be welcoming, encouraging of Indigenous people, in fact of all students, but including Indigenous students. Almost goes without saying you need well-trained, high-quality teachers, but I think it's worth saying that. You know, that is a crucial ingredient of good education. And clearly, Indigenous culture and knowledge need to be valued. When Wayne and I were talking at the beginning about how often that kind of knowledge and culture just isn't accommodated in the mainstream. It's not recognised and the mainstream doesn't have good ways of being able to build in that knowledge and culture. And I think our evidence would suggest that's a job for the mainstream. Now, it's not a job for Indigenous people to be able to do that. It's a job for mainstream Australia to be able to tap into all that Indigenous wisdom. And we, we certainly found that was the case. So... <coughs> As in terms of education, uh, th this factor is absolutely crucial about connecting to family, community, culture and country and about pathways to health. Um, I thought one of the, the things that we read in the evidence that was so strongly was that if you look at language and the way many Indigenous colleagues will talk about country, talk about their land, it's very much the same as as many people might talk about a person. You know, it's that kind of engaged, relational aspect to land and country. And that really needs to be recognised. And maybe I think it's probably hard for people without that frame of reference to get that. But if mainstream Australia needs to get that and appreciate it and try and understand it. I suspect it's hard to understand it when you come with a, a gaze that's been um, impacted by industrialization and the impact of sort of Western civilization and so on. But it's about how do you incorporate the fact that some people, that, uh, that indigenous people have that connection to country and land in programs. And I think that's a real challenge for people to do that effectively. An important part of that, and I won't because um, clearly we're going to hear much more about that from Janet after morning tea, is that programs need to be locally driven and owned by Indigenous communities. Um, elders are absolutely vital to involve because they're the font of all this knowledge, the custodians of the knowledge, and absolutely vital to bringing that perspective into mainstream programs. Um, Programs need to be built on a strength focus, looking at the strengths of Aboriginal communities, how they can be developed, how they can be strengthened, how they can be enhanced. Women are absolutely crucial to taking leadership and governance roles. And I was commenting before, this audience certainly is putting that into practice for the mainstream. There's very few men here. We're mainly a female audience. And again, it's about good staff. And it's also about um, strategic intersexual partnerships. In other words, how do we make joined up government work? Because otherwise, you know, if you're an indigenous community and you keep having these siloed governments coming in and talking to you, might be the employment mob one week, the education the next, the custodial people the next, the police. It's, it's a weird message to get because if you live in a community, you don't see the world like that. It's about your life. So that is, I think, a big challenge for our government in general. But how do you get government to be joined up and be able to talk to communities without a constant round of visitors from different departments that aren't really talking to each other? So that seemed to be an important thing to do. Um, employment and income. Uh, obviously... The pathway to health there is about more resources for health and well-being. And we did find in the literature some debate about that. I mean, there, there's some indigenous voices saying, well, you know, employment is really a Western way of doing things, a European way. Is that what we want? Or, you know, is it more about caring for country? So I think we need to acknowledge that, that there are those debates, those issues. Um, and 
however, when we looked at, well, if Indigenous people do want to engage in the workforce, then the employment service agencies in the mainstream, the feedback we got there is that they're perhaps not always appropriately geared up to the needs of Indigenous people. And if they are going to be, then they really need culturally competent and trained staff. They need to have that commitment. They need to have good links to businesses. They need to develop collaborative partnerships and, and give people that holistic support. So it's not just about the job, it's about people getting a job in the context of their life. You know, what kind of support they need is about maybe looking at issues of childcare, issues of further training, um, issues of what does a workplace require and how does that fit with the rest of your life. Um, we also looked at the literature on income management stemming out from the Northern Territory intervention and found there really wasn't a clear picture there. The evidence was uncertain. There's very polarised views, I think, around whether or not that intervention has worked and, and we review some of that evidence. Um, and I think overall... Looking at increasing um, employment opportunities is really quite complex. It's embedded in the sort of historical experience of Indigenous people in working in workplaces in Australia, and it's embedded in the deeply ingrained racism that we found very evident in the literature as a, quite a barrier to people being able to successfully integrate with workplaces. Um, so in terms of housing, the pathways to health, the, the sort of relationships are that that's a very complex path, it's multi-directional, if, if you're not in good health it can be hard to get, a, to, to, to get good housing, um, if you don't have good housing it can impact on your health, so that relationship can work both ways. Uh, Housing has a huge impact both in urban areas but especially in remote areas where there are just many more difficulties of maintaining good safe housing, whether it's housing hardware or housing software. Um, there are now standardised methods for improving health hardware. That we, we do have more experience now and we, we do have, there is a much better evidence base about how that can be done effectively. It does require local skills. Um, we found that collaboration with indigenous housing associations seems to be particularly effective and that comes back to those issues of control and cultural appropriateness. Um, one of the best buys in terms of housing has to be preventing people getting into the cycle of homelessness because once people do that, then there tends to be a really difficult set of health consequences that come out of being homeless and, and a whole range of other problems. So the best, the best buy is certainly investing in prevention. And once again, any case management needs to be strengths-based and holistic. But I think the important message is the most effective thing is to be able to give people access to good housing and prevent people becoming homeless because we know Indigenous people are much more likely to be homeless than other people in the community. And then again, racism, I think, is one of those factors which is really um, underpinning um, so many of these other social determinants. And I think some of the data that I presented at the beginning shows the way that the increased stress that's associated with being the victim of a racist assault really has such a strong impact on your mental and physical health. And I know in my research group we did some research on racism in Adelaide a few years ago and it was really quite shocking finding out the level of everyday racism for Indigenous people in, in suburban Adelaide so that most, in, the, most of the Indigenous people we spoke to, every time they left their house, they were risking a racist assault. And I think you need to imagine, I'm sure those of you who are Indigenous know what that feels like, but for people who aren't, I think if you imagine those physiological effects of racism, it means every time you leave your house, you know, you're risking all those body systems kind of going into overdrive and having all those bad effects on your body, just simply because you might have a racist assault, and then if you do, then it becomes much worse. So I think that's the background against which we need to think about this information. So the sorts of things that we found were success factors are obviously anti-discrimination legislation. That's saying, well, this is not legal. It's against the law to assault someone in racist terms. 
Um, again, universal interventions across settings are really important. So you create a climate in which racism is unacceptable. And, and also organisational development. And there we pointed to the AFL as an organisation that's really taken that on and really tackled it and tried to say this is not acceptable in our sport. And then we also looked at the literature on social marketing and diversity training. And again, there's some mixed messages there. If something like diversity training isn't done well, it can actually have the reverse effect. It can kind of strengthen prejudice rather than reduce it. So um, people who are designing those programs really need to take into account the evidence, which means it really has to be about challenging false beliefs, um, not making people feel guilty, but saying, well, this is not acceptable, but there are ways that you can change this. Giving people accurate information on indigenous culture and really challenging their preconceptions that are, are probably false. And also just looking, presenting people with the information of what being racist does to people in terms of the impact on their, their health, their physical, their mental health and their well-being. And um, also emphasising the shared values that all people have and, of course, again, involving people in the development and design of programmes. So there, there is some evidence there about what works well, but there's also scope, I think, for a better, stronger evidence base. Um, then the other area that we looked at was generally looking at interactions with government systems. Um, and looking at how people are treated in systems such as the criminal justice system, the health system, and obviously um, that kind of interaction has a direct impact on health. Um, once again, we found um, the sorts of... You can see these very common themes running through the evidence base that culturally competent staff and service delivery is vital. It needs to be the basics. But it's clear that that doesn't always happen in services, in, in all forms of services. Um, indigenous people working in systems is really important so that, um, that that's one of the... That, it's why we have employment targets. That's why, you know, at my medical school and many other medical schools, we've got special programs to recruit Indigenous medical students, for instance, whether, and that would be the same for nursing, for the police or whatever. So that's a really important intervention. Again, the holism and strengths-based is a vital approach to, to that. Um, collaborative partnerships, and again, a community development approach. So if you take crime prevention, it should be about a whole-of-community approach. It shouldn't be about sort of victim-blaming and, and um, targeting people and, and trying to prevent crime that way. It should be about saying, well, we need to invest in a community. We need to look at how we can... Um, look at promoting activities for young people that, are, that would work to prevent crime. And in the health system, I think the message is very strong that primary health care is vital and the Aboriginal community controlled sector is, is a vital part of that. So um, looking at the ways in which having Aboriginal people running health services, but that's one part of it, but then the other part of it is how do the government's funders have to work in relation to those services? And I think one important piece of work was um, a piece of work done by Judith Dwyer and colleagues where she called it the Overburden Report and she looked at the ways in which um, many Aboriginal controlled health services have absolutely crazy reporting requirements. For each programme they're having to do far more reporting than a major teaching hospital that's spending goodness knows how many more billion, millions, well in some cases almost billions of dollars of, of government money. So making the accountability appropriate um, so that these services are not overburdened by administrative requirements. So I think that was another really major method. Now, I think this health behaviour one is, for me, a really interesting one because it's where people often lose their social determinant lens when they're thinking about this programme. So clearly, lifestyles affect health. Clearly, whether you smoke or, you know, whether you eat a healthy diet or whether you have enough exercise affects your health. And 
that can very quickly turn into a victim blaming method. Oh, if only people would stop smoking, eat healthy food, they wouldn't have a health problem, would they? Now, I'm sure you've all heard people saying that. But of course, it's very clear that people's behaviours reflect all those structural factors. You know, whether you have a job, whether you've got a house, whether you know, the culture is accepting of, of, your, um, of yourself, whether you're subjected to racist assaults and so on. So those factors, acknowledging the impact of those broader determinants on health, is a crucial part of having a successful behaviour change strategy. The evidence on behaviour change isn't great. We've now got 30, 40 years of people trying to change behaviour by just giving them marketing messages, and we know that doesn't work. There is an evidence base on that, even though people keep ignoring that evidence base. But we do know that if you change the environment so that you can make healthy choices that easy choices, then you're more likely to have a behaviour change. The other thing we know about behaviour change is if you're middle class in a good job and well off, it's much easier to change your behaviour than if you're poor, you're living in different circumstances and you're struggling to get by on a budget. So those kind of factors need to inform anything we do to try and change people's behaviour. So influencing environments the evidence is much stronger on that than just telling people in a finger-wagging way to change their behaviour. So a classic example is, of course, you know, restricting the supply of tobacco, making it much more difficult and more expensive to get tobacco. Um, and I think specifically in relation to Indigenous people, again, using strong community relationships to promote healthy lifestyles is a much more important way to go than, than kind of this... Uh, an almost victim-blaming punitive way. And um, there was some success of sort of engaging young people in alternative activities, in healthy activities, as showing that, well, that could be successful if there was a whole-of-community approach behind that. Um, and, you know, promoting smoke-free workplaces, for instance, is about changing the environment rather than just kind of penalising the individual. So... Um, so I don't think, I think the health behaviours has to be seen in terms of the other range of social determinants. You know, in a way, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The health behaviours are what results from when very often the other social determinants aren't working well. And you might live in a community where healthy food supply is very expensive. It's quite difficult to do exercise. Smoking is one of the few easy pleasures that you can indulge on and so on. So we really need to think about that. Okay, well, watching the time. So the next slide is really about what we don't know, and I think this has got some important messages. Um, the first one is that there is actually a lack of good evaluation data on social determinants. Um, the evaluation culture, I think, around lots of our program is very weak. Um, I think there's a real resistance to adverse results, particularly in our bureaucracies. So rather than people wanting to learn um, a learning culture, there's, oh my God, what's the minister going to think? We have to, you know, as an evaluator, we're always being told that we have to produce positive results. Does that make sense? Do people recognise that? But I think that's, you know, that's really not a good investment of public funding if we're not prepared to learn from what works and what doesn't learn. So we would say we really need to have a much better learning culture around the use of evaluation. And as I said at the beginning, I think there's a lot of scope to evaluate mainstream service delivery. So at the moment, one of the obvious evaluations anyone would want to do is if a co-payment is introduced for GPs, what impact would that have on Indigenous people? And I noticed, um, what page was it, Janet? On, in the Australia Today, there was an article about Aboriginal peak groups getting together in Canberra because they're concerned about that impact. But if that goes ahead, I really hope someone will be evaluating that impact. So there's a change to a mainstream service. What impact does it have? Um, I think the other thing that we is that these, the causal links are very complex. They're multi-directional relationships. It's not like A leads to B. It's like here's A, it's linked to B, but then there's C, D, E. You know, there's a whole lot of other patterns going on there. And they're certainly not straightforward. So this is really about complex. So in any 
sort of evaluation, we really need to deal with that complexity. And it, it can't be a sort of straightforward trial. There has to be more complex evaluation designs. And of course, the other thing with social determinants, and this flows out of the causal links being complex, is it's very hard to say how much each determinant contributes to health. So you can't say, well, the criminal justice system is contributing this much to the 11 years of difference, education this bit, employment this bit, racism this bit. There's a complex interaction going on there. And, and therefore, it is quite hard for evaluators to make sense of that. I think there is now quite a considerable literature on evaluating complexity, but I'm not sure that we've entirely caught up with that in terms of our evaluation practice. So, and I think that when evaluation is better at capturing that complexity, it will give us more useful information to inform program design. So to summarize then, what are the key lessons we've come up with? Well, I think mainstream social determinants need to be flexible in order to respond to the needs of indigenous people. It's certainly never going to be one size fits all, and it certainly isn't going to be one size that fits the mainstream is going to fit indigenous people. There needs to be a lot of adaption. Cross-government coordination and collaboration between the government and community sectors is vital. I think, you know, joined-up governments become the catch, call of the catch cry of the 21st century, but we haven't got very good at doing it, and we need to get better. Um, we need to have a government leadership with full commitment to close the gap, and that came through whichever system we were looking at, criminal justice, education, employment. You need to have a leadership that gives that organisational culture of commitment to that. Everything needs to take into account the impact of colonization, the legacy of that, the legacy of trauma and grief, the, the stolen generation. That's lived experience and has to inform program design in understanding that. There needs to be active engagement of indigenous people, and we'll hear much more about that from Janet. Um, one thing that came through on a number of things is pilot funding people are very frustrated by. People don't want things funded for three years. It just starts to work and then the funding gets cut. We need long-term, not short-term funding. And I think that goes to issues of trust and engagement. Strengths-based approach seems to be vital in every sector. And we need good research and evaluation with adequate funding, including that of universal services. So just to finish... Um, I know that people can say, well, you know, we've been trying to improve indigenous health for many years, but it's not working. Well, I think um, Mandela put this very well when he says that poverty and equity are not the, the pre-adorned result of the forces of nature or the product of a curse of the deities, which very often people seem to think that may be indigenous disadvantages, but it's the consequences of decisions which men and women take, or perhaps more importantly, refuse to take. So I think that's a pretty powerful message for us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, I think this um, definitely shows the, the value of the work through the clearinghouse, that although we probably all in our own way are aware of the issues uh, that this research touched on, we now have an evidence base to go forward. And it's being able to rely on the evidence base that I think is probably the most convincing thing, at least for bureaucrats to be able to use with our ministers and with Cabinet. We now have uh, through to uh, 25 to 11 for questions. Any questions that people might have uh, of the Professor? There's, there'll be a roving mic, um, which uh, we've, we've got the mic holders at the back. Uh, so please raise your hand if you've got a question. Uh, and just remember that you're being recorded. Good morning. Can you tell us a little more about the employment aspects? The, that uh, it, it was new to me that uh, um, traditional care in the country um, is perceived as full-time employment, um, and of course it needs to be recognised uh, for its economic benefit, uh, as well as health and cultural and many, many others as well. Could you tell us more about that? Well, I, I'm I mean, very clear. Yeah, sorry. I mean, it's just the point that I, I guess to the acknowledging that there are debates amongst indigenous people about is this what we want to do engage in essentially a, a white construction of what employment is or do we want to spend our time caring for country caring for our culture 
uh, living a more traditional lifestyle. And, and it, that, that, that's a debate and that's a perspective. And I guess we just put the evidence in that context. Does that, or is that? Hmm. About that, yes, yeah. okay. There are some references, I think, that y you can follow up on in the report. Hmm. Oh, somebody just over there has got it first, I think, sorry. Then there's somebody down here. That's all right, go. Um, uh, my name's Re Rebecca McBenham from the Network of Alcohol and Other Drug Agencies. I was interested in you saying that the people are sick of pilots because certainly that's um, our experience in the alcohol and drug sector as well. Was there any indication as to what was an optimal length of funding yeah. agreement in order to start to see those results? And um, I guess part of that would be um, is, is there any evidence that there would be value in a predetermined length but with like an option to renew built into the service agreements if you could demonstrate that things were starting to work well? Yeah. Um I, I don't think we came across any evidence that said this is the optimal length. But, I mean, I suppose it's always struck me that we don't fund our hospitals as a pilot, do we? We don't say, well, can they show us they're working if not, you know. And so, I mean, it's like, why would we fund any other activity that we think is valuable as a pilot? I know when I was on the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, we had lots of discussion about this. And we thought there were models where you certainly need to have a review of if something isn't working and there needs to be accountability. But I don't know that time limiting anything would be useful if it's something that works. You know, that, I guess that would be my answer. That we, and, and I think the thing that does come up in the review is that when things are piloted and then dropped, there's a loss of trust and there's a loss of engagement, and there's a, a gain in cynicism that has implications for the future. And I'm not sure we always evaluate those um, consequences of pilots very well. And I know that one of the commissioners on the social determinants of health, Monique Bejan, she gave a very powerful speech in Canada and said, oh, Canada is a land of pilots. You know, we're always having pilots and spoke out very strongly about that. And I know in Canada that has had a big impact. And I think in Australia we could see ourselves as a land of pilots too. <laughs> yeah. I think some of them. Thanks. Um, my name is Monique Bond. Um, I've, we've been looking at the report at this um, a couple of pages on um, imprisonment and um, on page 56 there's a summary of interaction with government sy systems. Um, the really um, interesting thing that is missing from that is indigenous leadership and indi indigenous initiatives. It's all very much about, and I, I acknowledge that mm -hmm. this is a government thing. Nevertheless, it seems to me that a lot of the evidence you've been presenting suggests that the importance of indigenous leadership is absolutely essential. And in fact, um, I, I'd like your comment about what we can do to help that move higher mm. up and perhaps mm. uh, our, our, our MC yeah. um, might have some suggestions yeah. to, to really do that. And I'd like to strongly support um, the need for proper evaluations, which include things like um, anecdotal an evaluations, they're not all KPIs, and also the increasing criminalization of indigenous people through the move on powers and fines. Yeah. The number of people who are going to prison because of fines and the number of fines, things we're being fined for, is increasing imp exponentially. Yeah. I mean, I think there's nothing you said there that we disagree with. I think your point about indigenous leadership is absolutely vital and probably in the criminal justice system more than any other. I think your points about sort of the criminalization of people's lifestyles almost is, is a very good point. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, I think clearly this is an area of policy where we need much more evidence. And I agree that evidence can very often be in the form of stories 
stories in the form of um, people yarning on that, that that is a form of evidence and it's a very powerful form of evidence so I think what you said is fantastic but Wayne might like to talk about a more operational slant from Queensland I'll say what I'm allowed to say <laughs> But I, I think it's well acknowledged that uh, the government um, has been extremely bad, uh, particularly in the engagement space for many, many years. And I think a lot of it is uh, a legacy of when uh, the previous iteration of the department I'm working in actually controlled Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's lives down to the minutiae. Um, and that was through to the 1970s. You know, a lot of those controls were in place through to then, and still you see some remnants of that control. I think a part of all that is um, the belief that's built into a lot of government systems and some existing policies uh, in that we know best. Um, and I think part of it, and I don't want to say this in a patronising way, is that a government quite often goes into, or government representatives will go into a community and will will uh, engage with people at government level using government speak. Um, and the messages coming back are not what government agencies want to hear. So you go come back to Brisbane and you say, well, yeah, we've consulted. Yeah, we ticked that box, we've consulted. But um, uh, I know from personal experience, we really haven't listened. And that message continually gets made at community level. Come and listen to us, don't come and talk to us. And, but I think it's a big learning thing for, for government, government agencies. And I think the only way through it is to ensure that government is far better represented with uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in decision-making roles. The other point that I've picked up, I guess, over the last 10 years working in this area is that um, we are not good at including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the decision making relating to programs and policies affecting them. Quite often we set up what could be seen as fairly token engagement um, groups, um, you know, ministerial roundtables or whatever, no comment on the current ones. Um, but um, what we're not good at is going into our community, whether it's urban or regional, and saying, well, this is the issue that we need to address or the opportunity that we need to take advantage of. How best do we do that? Uh, how can we help you do that? Uh, and actually have the people affected by the decision, the final decision, included in the decision making and the program development. We're very, very far off the track. But mind you, a lot of NGOs are as bad as government, in my experience, and I think there's a lot of learning across the board. And it's evidence like this that I think we need to continually go back to. So you know, when Ben and I go back to, uh, to our department, um, we need to be consciously referring to the evidence base, not simply to anecdotes, because anecdotes don't go or don't last. David Hollandsworth, University of Sunshine Coast. Um, I'm really keen on the work that you've been doing and other people have been doing in terms of racism as a major factor in um, health outcomes and employment outcomes and, as mentioned before, the criminalisation of whole communities. Um, but a lot of the research is still operating at the individual um, language in the streets, that kind of stuff, inter actions with agencies, um, but not so much systemic and ideological racism and obviously they're harder to uh, analyse, they're harder to get data on, um, but I think that particularly in health service delivery and in social welfare delivery, uh, systemic racism seems to me to be absolutely fundamental and one of the most important barriers. Uh, so I guess I'd like your response to that and how we might move forward in terms of looking at that level rather than just at the sort of street based stuff um, and sorry one more thing when you were talking about homelessness I was reminded of the kind of new discourses of responsibility um, in terms of mutual obligation etc and the way that things like street three strikes in housing policy are, le are leaving mm. a lot of Aboriginal mm. people homeless mm. Mm. Um, without having any sense of what constitutes a strike. Um, so just mm. those kinds of ways that people are um, engaging with the state in, in most mm. unsuccessful mm. fashion. Thanks, David. Yeah, I mean, 
of, in terms of institutional racism, you can clearly get a window into that by talking to people about their experiences because at the end of the day. But it is about uncovering that invisible level of the way that all our institutions work that have a built-in whiteness bias or a racist bias. And um, I know my colleague Dennis McDermott at Flinders at the Post Centre is doing some fantastic work in looking at that. And I think he and his team will be doing more and more exciting work over the coming years because they really are looking at those kind of institutional levels. And I also think in terms of the health system, the Loicha Institute, which is our national centre for Aboriginal and um, Torres Strait Islander health, are doing are similarly doing work looking at those institutional racist questions. And I guess your example of the housing system that has a three strikes and you're out... Um, is a good example of an institutionally racist policy because it's not taking account of additional burdens and additional factors in um, indigenous people's lives and not finding out a way of working with those people to ensure that they don't lose their homes. So I'd say that's really important and it's, it's great that you, you highlighted that. Mm. Thanks. I just had a question that kind of builds on what you talked about before, whether... Um, the evidence suggested anything about the best way forward to support that joint up approach to government that addresses the social determinants um, across local, state and federal government mm -hmm. and also builds in the cultural aspects to uh, support a better um, Indigenous health outcomes? Yeah, that's a big question. I think in terms of Commonwealth-state relationships, don't take money away from the states. Might be. <laughs> Sorry, that was just a local one. Um, so, so, some of the research we're doing at the Southgate Institute, um, South Australia has a health in all policies approach, which is across our government. Um, I can tell you some of the key lessons that have come out of that about joined up government. I mean, one is that you need, it needs to be fully endorsed by the head of state. In this case, the Premier, it comes out of Premier and Cabinet, has their mandate. You know, it needs to have resourcing. It needs to link to state priorities. So in South Australia, I think Health in All Policies has only had any legs because it's linked to the South Australian Strategic Plan, which has been about joined up government. As part of our research, we, we talked to our, the Premier who started that, and very clearly... He wanted health in all policies because he wanted joined up government. He wanted talked about breaking down silos between governments. But if that's what a government wants, then they need to build in incentives to their senior executives to get that broken down, you know, so that their performance indicators are about having good joined up government. About, you know, you could imagine a performance indicator where you have to establish a database of all government departments going to every indigenous community. Every public servant has to check that database before they go, for instance. But unless you build it into people's reward structures and everyday way of doing business, it isn't going to happen. And I don't think we've yet got joined up government working at that incentive level as much as we could. I think there's much more scope to do that. Whereas very often it's seen as something you do if you happen to have time after doing your core business. And I think in terms of social determinants, if you want other sectors to address health, I know that uh, Carmel, Carmel Williams, who's the manager of our Health in All Policies Initiative in South Australia. She has always been so concerned. Yes, I'm interested in a health outcome, but no other sector is going to work with me unless it's also addressing their core business. So being really careful about that and not being a health imperialist if you come from the health sector and sort of, again, not wagging your finger at the housing sector and saying, oh my goodness, you need to look at your health impact, but saying, look, we're interested in health impact. How could we work with you so you can achieve your core business while we're also doing stuff that's good for health. So there's some of the lessons that are coming out of our health in all policy research. But that's, yeah. And I think if you looked at the general joined up government literature, there's similar messages that are coming out. Yeah, so thanks. Good morning. I work as a, a, a health facility planner, so with an architectural team, hospitals, uh, medical centres and things, and in, in a number of regional areas, and it's always um, quite a challenge to actually get um, the input that I have the expectancy should be there. And I've recently had an experience working in New Zealand, and the 
an absolutely delightful experience really in terms of having a clearly signed post approach almost and a, a high level of engagement, um, which is clearly the difference between the situations that we have. So I suppose I'm interested in, in your thoughts and, or, or anyone's thoughts and how we can actually move that forward because from my perspective that's a, a, a big um, opportunity we have to help mm. lift engagement. So you were talking about engagement with Indigenous communities specifically? How, how we can um, make, make sure that that engagement actually occurs and yeah. that people, and, and sometimes I suppose it's that um, the, the structure of the, the planning process does, does not have that yeah. level of consultation or it's, um, you know, not, yeah. not really, um, it's not really listening, it's just a tokenistic yeah. approach. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we could talk about that now, but would you be happy if, because Janet is centrally talking about that after tea, and Janet, I think you'll be really directly answering that question, yeah. wouldn't you? So you cover it. I mean, I, I think what's interesting, what you said is about architecture and design, and I think, you know, the engagement around Indigenous um, concepts of design and that is, is really important. I mean, I know now it's increasingly common... Um, to incorporate fantastic um, artwork and, you know, significant sort of um, artefacts in, into hospital and health service design, and I think that's really important. And the engagement is vital, and, and I'll leave it to Janet to, to do that after coffee. So thanks for raising that. That's great. We've probably got time for um, one more question or oh. two quick questions. Okay. Um, oh, my question's a little bit half-formed. Um, in Queensland, we're going through a youth justice reform process uh, and we're heavily, heavily overrepresented. It's something like 66% of the young people in the system mm. are Indigenous. Um, we've just passed a bill which included a whole bunch of measures like name and shame, um, removing the principle of detention as last resort mm. um, and several other measures like that. Um, and we're shortly to have a blueprint released which... Um, I'd be interested to know if DATSIP have even been um, consulted about, but it's meant to contain a range of preventative and other intervention measures. So I guess um, there is a shift, a rather punitive kind of shift in the mm. policy direction with regards to youth mm -hmm. justice, mm -hmm. and I think that's going to be a long-term process to, 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 to change that back mm. towards something that's mm. more evidence-based. But I guess I'm looking for some insight in what should we be looking for in terms of making that broader argument? Because I assume... Mm. The usual numbers will be collected around young people going into mm. detention and out of detention and recidivism, but, you know, to paint that broader picture yeah. about the impact on their lives, I'm just looking mm. for some insights on that and what we could be yeah. suggesting to government now. I mean, I think it, it, it's a funny debate because on the one hand, I think everyone gets the argument that prevention is better than cure, whether we're talking about criminal justice or we're talking about health. And there's a lot of data, you know, on... Um, justice reinvestment projects and so on that show that economically it makes sense, similarly with disease prevention. But there does seem to be a, a trend at the moment in Australia where we're pulling away from prevention, whether it's in justice and um, whether it's in um, health. And, you know, I come from a state with a Labour government and it's happening there. So this isn't necessarily a party political issue. It's happening, I think, with both parties. And it's been distressing in my state, South Australia, to see the state government pull out all its health promotion budget nearly, apart from the health in all policies, and, and to really withdraw from that, on, on, really on the back of a Commonwealth state argument about, well, that should be the, what the Commonwealth's doing. So I'm not, I actually don't know what the answer is. I mean, we've just seen a federal budget that's defunded our National Agency for Preventive Health, which, you know, and I imagine what the story you're telling is the same things happen in justice. I can only think that it's going to be about a community campaign with that slogan, prevention is better than cure, because I think people do sign up to that and do get it. But um, and other than that, there being some sort of social movement around that, I'm not quite sure because the economics are there. So we really need to push that that uh, bandwagon. I think. Just one more quick one. All right. 
Hi, my name's Lorna. Um, I'm from Sing and Grow and Play Group Queensland. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on... Um, I know that you said it's important for mainstream organisations and, and support services to be inclusive and that that um, would be more effective than having standalone services and, and programs. Um, but do you think that our present government funding structures actually support that or do they support more of those standalone structures? Would there need to be a bit of a change in focus for how they fund those changes to happen universally? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I think if you're going to change a mainstream, it's primarily a matter of culture change. And yes, people have certain funding priorities, but I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's, it's perhaps a bit outside my area of expertise, I mean, because each department's funded differently. But it seems to me that it would be, you know, it's a culture change for the senior executive leadership to say one of our priorities is closing the gap. Therefore, this is the implication for our mainstream organisation and its policies. You know, they all have to be orientated towards this goal of closing the gap. So I'm not so sure that is necessarily about funding streams. You know, for me, it's about the priorities of the organisation, the reward structures in the organisation, how the whole organisation is geared up to make that contribution to closing the gap in effect. But I'm sure there's a lot more discussion around that. So thanks. Would you all join me in uh, thanking Professor Bell? I'm now breaking for morning tea, and if we could be back here at 5 to 11. Great, thank you.